Welcome to the Life Hacks Show. Life Hacks gives you proof hacks and tips for the best version of yourself. And here is your crash test dummy for a better life, Marcus Moira. Hey guys, welcome to a new episode of the Life Hacks Show. Today with with a good buddy and good friend, Jasper Rivers from the Netherlands. Jasper, how are you doing? I'm great, Marcus. I'm great. Uh, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for your time and thanks for for being on the show. For sure. Thanks for the opportunity. You're calling yourself the traveling Dutchman. What does it mean? Well, it means that I'm Dutch and that I travel. <laughs> Where do you travel and how long are you doing this? Uh, I'm traveling already for about six years. Uh, I used to work in finance um, in Amsterdam and Chicago. And after six years uh, sitting in an office on a desk behind uh, a bunch of flat screens, uh, I decided that uh, I wanted more adventure in my life. And uh-huh. I uh, quit my job, sold all my belongings, and I, uh, I started traveling and never, never really looked back since. Wow, that that sounds like 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 very easy what what you have done, and sounds like it was a no brainer. Was it that easy, or no? What what challenges did you have on your way till you're there where you're now? Well, first of all, to make the decision to give up a, a career that you've been working on for six years and that's financially very rewarding is not an, a very easy step. It's not something that you just come up with one day and, and do it. You know, I, yeah. I probably thought about this, this step for about a year. And even though I had some savings, uh, it was still quite scary because I, I didn't really know anything else than, than my trading job. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't sure if, uh, if I would ever have to go back to another job and you know, what kind of job it would be. And you know, if I would make the same amount of money, probably not. Mm-hmm. So, so it was still uh, quite a, a scary move, but I felt like I had no choice because really? I, well, I thought that I, I, was, I was sure that the life that I was leading at the time wasn't really going to make me happy. It wasn't really what I wanted from life. That's what I knew. How, and how, so, did, it, how did it look like? Well, I mean, I was I was doing really well financially. You know, I was living in a an awesome condominium in, in you know downtown Chicago. Yeah. I was driving a sports car. I was <laughs> like, you know, I, I I had a lot of money. Yeah. But uh, but I I had to sit in this office the whole day. And mm-hmm. you know, when I grew up, I was thought that uh, that making a lot of money was what I was supposed to do. That that was what yeah. success was. Yeah. Right. But when I achieved that, it, I, I didn't really get the fulfillment from it. So. You know, I had to sort of like re rethink what I wanted from my life. Uh huh. And were there a special situation or moment where where you started to rethink, or did it come slowly? It kind of started slowly creeping up on me, but there was one particular moment where I was out with some friends, and you know, so in the U.S., people people support success a lot, especially financial success. Right? They're they're very excited about that. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I met a bunch of people. And they were all, you know, telling me that they were very jealous of my situation and stuff. Mm. And then um, I, I went back home. And as soon as I got home, I sat on the couch and I just kind of stared at the ceiling for like 10 minutes. And I had this weird feeling where I thought, you know, I don't really feel super excited about this, but everybody is telling me that I should be. Mm. You know, so there was a real like disconnect in my mind. And that was kind of the moment that I realized, okay, you know, I, th- I think I have to change something. Mm-hmm. Normally, it comes from people who are not at this stage. Eh? They they assume it's going to be great if you have money, if you have the car, you can buy everything. Mm-hmm. But once you're at this level, I think it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's not what what many people think about. It feels like. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, like society tells you, well, well, as you grow up, that that's kind of like the ultimate success, right? Mm-hmm. And so you expect a lot from it. Yeah. You, you really expect that it's going to give you fulfillment, it's going to give you happiness, and it, it really doesn't. But it's it's hard to to understand that before you get to that point. Yeah, I see. I see. I think the whole system and the whole education is is formed like this, getting people into jobs and then seeking for this ultimate ultimate satisfaction, which is which is not not true and not for real. If once you're at this step, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, the you know education 
uh, they should probably have some sort of class where where they, you teach people how to how to figure out what you want from life, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, because nobody ever really, you know, I never really asked myself. I just kind of assumed that you know, just being successful with a career was was the solution, and you know, no one really challenged me to to think about that idea, you know, or to challenge that idea. So I think it would be very good to uh, to you know have some sort of education uh, geared towards that in uh, when you're younger. Mm. What were your first resources when you came to the point that it's not that fulfilling as you were thinking about? Where where did you start when you were sure, okay, maybe I have to change something in life. Maybe I need to orientate on other purposes. Well, I mean, for me, it's, you know, I always knew in the back of my head that I, I wanted to travel for an extended period of time. You know, I always had the dream of, of just traveling the world by myself for like a year. And I, I thought it was just going to be a year at the time. So, you know, I had enough savings from, from my financial career. So I was thinking, okay, well, you know, if I travel for one year and then I have to go back to some, some job, yeah. um, then, you know, at least I get to, I, at least I get to have that experience, right? At least I get to sort of live that dream of, of traveling for a year. So I figured I'll just start with that. And then um, I remember I went to Brazil first, and that's where I read the book that you know I'm sure you have read and everybody everybody <laughs> else has read the Four Hour War Week. Uh-huh. I think back then uh, this is six years ago. I don't know how how well known the book was back then, but uh, but that that's the first time uh, that I suddenly started realizing, hey, you know maybe I can travel and work at the same time mm-hmm. because I honestly like when I was at my job I. I really didn't know if that was even possible. Like, it didn't even cross my mind that that was possible. Yeah, yeah. Same for me. So, yeah, when we started out, it was never planned, like like being location independent and working on the road. Uh, we just stumbled into this lifestyle. But I heard from many people that it's it's really like a great trigger reading this book and and then like seeing a whole new perspective of life and seeing a whole new option. And and this gives many people the drive to go on and stick to it yeah absolutely like you it, it's funny like how you just don't consider it as part of reality until you see somebody mm. who's actually you know who's made it happen and i actually met a, a german guy at the at the same time i was reading the book mm. and he, he was the first person that i've ever met wow. who was actually doing this lifestyle you know he was he was doing some sort of affiliate marketing ah. and uh, I, i really remember like sitting with him at the bar looking at him he was like 25 years old and i was literally thinking like so this the stuff that i'm reading in that book you know this is not some sort of like dream this, mm. i'm sitting right next to a person who's actually living that dream right now and and so those two things the book and meeting that person was was really what what kind of inspired me to you know to to find out how how i could make that happen uh-huh yeah and this was in brazil at this time when you were traveling yeah exactly yeah okay cool and so and what what were the next steps and did you did you have a good chat with this guy at the bar about affiliate marketing and and you went for affiliate marketing or did you test some other stuff out and how how did you find your way well i really had no idea what affiliate marketing was i mean i didn't know anything about computers i didn't know anything about internet i didn't know anything about websites I literally, you know, the only thing I knew was was finance, was trading, you know, and, and so I had no idea where to start. And so I literally Googled how to make money online. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's and, literally how and, I started. And um, staying in this financial area and, and trading on your own was not, not an option at this time? Because well, in nowadays, it, I, I know co-working spaces like Sundays and Tagazoo Morocco, they have like these trading screens there. Uh, hanging in a co-working space, which is quite impressive. Yeah, no, I, I noticed that too. There's a lot of people who are trading right now um, and they're, they're traveling around. But at the time, um, I, I don't know if the if the, the software was was yet available. But but the other thing is, I you know I, I just sat, sat in an office for six years behind these screens and I really wanted to do something different, you know? Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, you know, maybe in the future I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back to trading if I have to. But uh, but I really wanted to try something new. 
Yeah, got it. So you were, you were literally starting from scratch from zero. You were just mentioning. Absolutely, I was starting absolutely from scratch. And you know, when, when, it's funny when I look back now. <laughs> I think back then there weren't so many resources like these days you have a lot of websites that sort of teach people you know, how to start online businesses and all that kind of stuff. But I remember back then I couldn't really find a lot of good information. You know, we, we didn't have uh, the, the, you know, the fire uh, entrepreneur on fire, like mm. Pat Flynn and all those guys, yeah. you know, they like, um, so, so I didn't find very, very good advice i remember what so i kind of what, what popped up on on google when you were <laughs> searching for how to make money online well the first thing i ran into was something called seo which oh. at the time i had never heard of but uh i looked into it and uh and then i i had this idea to start a lot of websites and just build a one-page website mm -hmm. with the with a certain keyword in the url mm -hmm. And then just optimize that one page for that keyword, and then use Google Ads to monetize it. I mean, that was that was that was the first thing I came up with after after reading a little bit about SEO, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought it was a really good idea. And it actually worked surprisingly. Looking back, I'm surprised, but but it actually did work. And it's mm -hmm. because I was in Brazil and I, I looked at the, the keywords that people search for in Brazil, and there were some uh, some really high uh some keywords with really high traffic so i was actually able to make uh, a couple thousand dollars a month uh, just but just by putting up some really simple websites for a while okay and the, these websites were in english or on portuguese no they were in portuguese so i i, I hired somebody to uh to literally write a random article mm. about some some keywords i mean some of the keywords i didn't even know what that meant yeah Yeah, I just saw that there was like 500,000 people yeah. per month searching for it. It's, it's, so. a, it's, it's really crazy in, in, uh, what worked for, for Google and how you could game Google in, in these days. In former, I know. former times, like six, seven years ago. I don't know if, if it still worked, but like white font on white background and hiding some keywords like on the very right side out of your screen and, and all this white stuff. I know. No, I, I was shocked to be honest, because because you know that I, I actually thought at the time I thought, wow, I'm a, you know look at me, I'm I'm smart. I, I just figured it out within a few months. I'm already making money. You know, I was like, this is amazing. But uh, but after a few months, well, it, it lasted for I don't know maybe like six months or a year or so, mm -hmm. and then um, and then Google <laughs> Google actually shut down my account because they they didn't like my business model so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah but this is i think also a, a very tough moment or a strange feeling i know from many seos in in germany I, i'm also coming from the seo industry and went broader than in online marketing and then into entrepreneurship but when i started out as an seo i know that there were agencies with employees and, and lots of people uh, employed just based on the business model setting up crappy niche websites which worked at these times and then google changed the algorithm like like the famous google dances and and then their whole business was like shut down on zero and they had to 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 let people go out of the out of their companies so yeah was it hard for you well um basically what i did at the time i i, I tried something else you know i tried a uh a nutrition supplement um, business with a website. And, and that was largely also based on the stuff that I learned from SEO. Mm -hmm. And then when one of those, uh, one of those update, updates hit, I think it was either Panda or Penguin or something. And, uh, and then my, uh, my nutritional supplement business kind of collapsed too, because it was, it was also built on uh, my SEO uh, knowledge. So, okay. you know, so definitely uh, I was definitely one of the, uh people that was uh, affected by that but but you know uh you know looking back that that was a that was a great thing for me to happen because as a result you know i, f I figured out uh, a more fulfilling and um more fulfilling things to do and doing things that i'm more passionate about so i'm actually very happy that uh, that google shut down my account and then uh, and then they introduced the panda and the penguin and stuff yeah. even though it killed my business I'm still happy because the stuff that I'm doing now is, you know, is much more fun. It's I'm more, mm -hmm. way more passionate about it. I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm, I'm way more contributing to, to the world by what I'm doing now. So, 
And it's, it's funny, you know, because it's often the case that when something happens, you initially think it's bad. Yeah. And then later it, it turns out that it's actually a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I've, I've realized this so many times also in, our, in my life and talking to friends and other entrepreneurs, it's always like at the end, you can connect the dog dots and say, okay, this, this was exactly what should have happened to me at this time of period, because now <coughs> this gave me the right direction to where I'm, I am now. Exactly. You know, um, you know, there's a, there's a book, it's called the, the obstacle is the way. And it talks all about how what you think is an obstacle is that could actually be like a, you know, a stepping stone to something much better. And, and it often is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very often. So you change your business again. And what did you do? What did you do next? So after Google kind of killed my, my business, um, I, I was, I ran into Airbnb hmm. and, uh, you know, I had been renting out my apartment, uh, to long-term renters in, in Amsterdam and that wasn't, wasn't really making much money. And I, I also didn't like the fact that I couldn't stay in my own house when I was back home. Yeah. So I thought, you know what, let me just focus on this Airbnb thing for, for a while. So I, I listed my apartment on Airbnb. I read every, every resource I could find. Uh, I spent a lot of time like optimizing, uh, that, that business learning how to be a good host, learning how, to, how the system works, how Airbnb, the website works, the algorithm, etc. cetera. And, uh, and soon enough, uh, I, was, I was making a lot of money for my apartment. So that was, that was really cool because you know, then I kind of realized, hey, I, I don't really have to have a, another business. I can, I can live off my apartment right now. Ah, cool. Um, and your apartment was based in Amsterdam or where is it? Yeah, it's in Amsterdam. That's okay. right. So, so there was already enough demand, but because I think, yeah, maybe nowadays it, it should work also in some remote <laughs> areas. But at these days, when, when what it was Airbnb already that popular? No, when I started uh, back in 2012, it was definitely a lot smaller than it is now. I think at the time there were, there were maybe like two, three hundred thousand listings worldwide or maybe even less. Mm -hmm. And I think right now there's over two million. So, you know, it was definitely, um, It was definitely a lot smaller, but there was, you know, there was a lot of demand. I was, uh, I started making money like, pretty much from the get go. And, you know, yeah. and, and later as I, as I optimized my listing, my, my income went up even more, but yeah, I mean, Amsterdam is a good place to do Airbnb mm, uh, you know, to start with. So it's a great city. Huh? It's a lot to do there. Lots of entertainment. I think people love it. Yeah, exactly. And it's also, it's also not very, not that seasonal, you know, even though we have a winter, uh, it's, it's really only January, February where the, the amount of visitors goes down a bit, but the rest of the year it's, it's very stable and steady. Mm -hmm. Cool. So you make a living out of your Airbnb flat at the moment. Well, I mean, this is, you know, this is like three, four years ago that I started mm -hmm. doing it. And at the time I was like, well, this is awesome. I, I don't have to do anything else. So I just, yeah, I just, uh, focused on my Airbnb listing and, mm -hmm. um, I was, I was having fun. I was started this travel blog. Um, what is you know, just, just, it's the traveling Dutchman and the URL, the traveling Dutchman.com. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I, I just started doing that on the side, uh, for fun really. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that, that kind of taught me, you know, how to run a blog and what, and, and the possibilities there are to also monetize a blog. Cause I, I never knew about that. So after a while I was, uh, you know, I was just like, kind of like having a good time, like going to all these beach places, partying and so, et cetera. But you also get bored of that at some point, right? Where, where so, are the best parties <laughs> where you've been? Oh God. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm Brazil, sure, had, I'm sure you tested a lot. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, Brazil is is amazing. I, I spent a lot of time in Florianopolis in the in the south. Mm -hmm. um, I spent New Year's in Brazil on the beach twice in a place called uh, São Miguel dos Milagres, which was really fun. Um, you know, I was I was kind of like globetrotting. I was I was going around the world visiting friends in different places and just hanging out. And, and it was great fun, but, um, but at some point I, I wanted to be more productive. I wanted to do something cool. Okay. So then I, then I thought, you know what, I already know how to do a blog. I, uh, I, I had already written, written a book about traveling. And so the next thing I came up with was, you know, let me, let me be the Airbnb expert. Why don't I write a book about Airbnb? Because mm. I saw that a lot of hosts weren't really good, doing a good job. They were leaving a lot of money on the table. So I, I wrote a book about Airbnb hosting, get paid for your pad. 
And then I started a podcast, and I also started a blog about Airbnb. And how did that? How did that go with that book? Yeah, the book went went really well. I mean, the first book I wrote was a travel book that completely failed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Amazon didn't even uh, accept it because they told me it was too generic. The information <laughs> really? was too generic. Yeah, <laughs> never heard about so, this. Uh, that they refused. Yeah, so that was <laughs> that was kind of like uh, I was a little bit depressed for a week or so because I worked on it really hard. Wow, but it taught me a very uh, important lesson. It taught me the lesson to to focus on you know a very specific niche when you write a book. And then also to write the best book in in that niche. So I read every single book on, on Airbnb that was out there. There was like maybe 10 books or something at the time. Mm-hmm. So I read all of them. I searched the internet for weeks, you know, trying to find articles about, about Airbnb hosting. And I sort of uh, combined my own experience with everything that I could find on the internet and all the knowledge that I, that I got from those other books. And then I really uh, made it my goal to just create the best book on Airbnb hosting available. And I think it was that focus that I had that made it successful. Mm-hmm. Cool. How long does, did it take you to write this book? Well, the actual writing of the manuscript didn't take me that long. I, I think I spent about a month on it. But then there was a lot of other stuff that uh, that comes with you know publishing a book. It's like the interior design, it's the pictures, it's the formatting, it's the layout, it's the editing, the proofreading, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the whole process actually, mm-hmm. including launching it, the whole process actually took uh, almost uh, yeah, about six months. Mm, okay. And do you have some special hacks or tricks you want to share how to how to launch? And I think your book really took off, right? Was an Amazon bestseller yeah. then? Yeah, it, it, it did really take off um, and it's still doing very well. Like it's, the sales are still very consistent and I'm actually about to launch the second version. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm almost doubling the content. So, uh, so I'm really excited about that. But um, yeah, it did, it did do really well. And we had some help from somebody who, was, uh, who had a lot of knowledge about how to publish on Amazon. Mm-hmm. So some of the things that are important is you know, picking the right categories Like you can pick two categories and, you know, you want to make sure you pick one category that's not too competitive because then it will be easier to, to get to number one in that category. Mm, okay. So, you know, that, that, that's a big thing. And then, you know, it's also about uh, putting in the, the right keywords in the, in the right places so that, you know, when somebody searches for Airbnb now on Amazon, my book is the first one to show up out of like 400 results. And it also has to do with uh, with you know put, making sure that the word Airbnb is in the in the title and the description and the sub subtitle etc. So there's a you know there's a few things and then also of course uh, you want to get a lot of reviews. So um, that's that's another thing that you need to uh, be aware of that you get some reviews before you launch the book so that when you know when it's when people can buy it, it, it you, have, you already need some reviews right because nobody's going to buy a book that has no reviews. Mm-hmm. So you want to get some you want to get some reviews from from friends family or you want to send your book to some uh, some people who can review it for you. So those are probably uh, I'd say the, the most important uh, most important things. Mm. And you went on with the book, or what was the next step after the book? I think you just mentioned the, a website you built up for especially for this book, or was it on on the topic Airbnb in general? Yeah, I initially just created the site uh, just to have a place where I could, you know, kind of promote and, and show the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, as, after I built it, I thought I might as well write some articles about Airbnb, you know, because I, I already knew so much about it. And I really like talking about Airbnb. I like writing about Airbnb. So it, it turned into a blog. And, you know, now it's uh, the blog is actually doing pretty well, too. It's making some money because I have a bunch of affiliate deals. Um, and I, I also started a podcast, mm. also kind of just out of just for fun as well, but also to try and like you know support the book sales a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know I've recent I've I've also uh, created a video course on Airbnb hosting, and I have a Fiverr service. So I you know I kind of have this whole business around Airbnb yeah. hosting now. Cool, cool. So your takeaway would be or your recommendation for people who who don't know where to stick or where to focus on to to find one topic and then being the best expert possible on this topic and then scaling like your online info products 
Yeah, exactly. Like because when you start out, you don't have much credibility yet, right? And so, you know, you, if you're competing against somebody who's already have a, a book on Amazon with uh, with twenty, thirty reviews, or maybe somebody who's already written multiple books, then that's really hard. So you you really want to pick a very, very, very specific topic. Uh, you know, I, I'd say like try to niche down as much as you can until you've you've reached such a such a specific topic that you can easily become the number one expert in that niche. You know? And then once you gain credibility, once you get some get some reputation, then you can you can start talking about broader subjects, right? Mm -hmm. So now for example, if I were to write another book, I could make it a little bit broader. I could maybe write a book on the sharing economy, right? Because because now I already have some credibility in that in that niche with this more specific niche Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And how do you make sure that the audience is still big enough? Well, the cool thing about Airbnb and one of the reasons that I chose Airbnb is because I expected it to grow very fast, you know, because it's, you know, obviously the sharing economy is, is something that's growing, but particularly in Airbnb, I just noticed that the website was, it was so easy to use it. You know, these, these guys are very innovative. And so I figured, the Airbnb niche will be a growing niche, and, and it really is because since I wrote the book, there's now four times more Airbnb hosts than there were at the time when I wrote the book. So, mm. you know, the trend is my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I know that you're also very active on producing online courses on Udemy. That's uh, right. Can you tell me a bit more about how you, you tackle this topic and how... Yeah, how professional or how serious you have to take it? Because yeah, once in a while you always hear about yeah, just launch a course on Udemy, and I think many people try it, but maybe they're missing something to get that successful that like you are on Udemy. Well, I mean, honestly, if you want to get your income from the platform Udemy, then you it's a long term process you need to you need to reserve like one to two years i'd say oh. to build up a significant student base to make significant income you know like i'm making about five between 500 and a thousand dollars and you know i started about a year ago mm. and um so but th but there's different ways that you can use udemy you know you don't have to be a full-time udemy instructor you can you know you can there's different ways to do it. You could also just create one Udemy course and market it to your own audience. You know, if you have, if you already have an audience, then you can use Udemy simply as like a video hosting and payment platform. Mm, all right. Or, or if you want to, if you want to learn how to do video and not necessarily seeing Udemy as your as your end goal, but if you just want to be become good at making video courses, then Udemy is also a great platform because it has a lot of resources and tools for you to produce a really good video course. Mm -hmm. Plus it has all these different uh, functionalities to get feedback from, from, uh, from your students. You can communicate with your students. You can see like which videos get watched more than, than others. You can even see at which point your students will drop off in your videos. So you can see when it gets boring. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can get reviews because you can literally, if you make it, if you do a free promotion on Udemy, you get thousands of students, right? And so that you can use those students to sort of like experiment and, and learn how to create a really good course. And then once you've learned that, mm. you know, you can take those skills and apply them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like Teachable or other platforms where you are yeah, more I mean, the, the host, but then I think you already need to have a big audience like you were just mentioning, like bringing all the traffic then on this platform instead of participating on the traffic, which is already on that marketplace Udemy. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you, uh, if you, if you're using teachable, then, um, you know, you can, you can publish it on your own side, but you don't necessarily, I mean, it's not, I think even if you have a small blog with a small audience, it's not a bad idea to learn, uh, how to create good videos because, you know, video is a trend in itself. Right. And so, you know, whether you can use those skills in different ways, you can also, you know, maybe you want to do some YouTube videos in the future, or maybe instead of writing a lot of content, you want to maybe produce some videos on your blog. Right. So, you know, it, the, the video is just, it's just a really uh, interesting uh, medium 
um, to to communicate with your audience. You know, it's a it's a much more personal way to communicate with your audience because body language is you know makes up a larger percentage of of, of communication. You know, the the words that you that you say or write is only like seven percent of uh, what you communicate. So. Mm. So even if you're if you don't necessarily want to pr- create a course that you're going to sell to your audience, it's it's still a great way to to learn more about video. Definitely, and and you get all these data insights you were just mentioning, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, you can get uh, you can get some really interesting insights in in the uh you know the, in how much you the people uh, like your videos so you can you can experiment a lot let's say you create a little course and you put like 20 videos up there and you experience you do one talking head you do one one screencast you do a combination you experiment with some different visuals and then you just uh, get a couple thousand students in your course and then you just look at you know which are which are the videos that people watch and how long do they watch them for And that tells you a lot about, you know, what is a good video. Because if you think about it, like, what is a good video? Well, well to me, a good video is a video that people watch. Because you know, people have very short attention spans on the Internet. Mm. So if you, if you can make, like, a three- or four-minute video and you can learn how to make it interesting and engaging and, and visually appealing so that people, like, the majority of people who start the video actually make it all the way to the end, that's a very, very, very valuable skill to have. Yeah, totally. And is there any way um, to get the data from Udemy, like all the people who paid for your for your video to build an own list on own audience, or is Udemy that very restrictive? Yeah, no, they won't provide you with the email addresses, but what you can do is, there's two things. You can message people, so you can build some relationship with them. And then, of course, in your profile, you can mention your website. Mm. And you're also allowed, you're also allowed to, uh, to mention uh, resources outside of Udemy. So you're allowed to promote your own website that way, as long as you don't point people towards a page where you ask them either for the email address or to buy something. Mm. So, and, and there's another thing. You can also send out announcements to all your students. So let's say you want to, you know, so you kind of want to direct more people to your own website. You can send out four announcements a month and you can literally just write a blog post on your website and then send out an announcement to all your Udemy students and say, hey guys, I wrote this interesting blog post. It's, you know, it's co- it covers these and these topics and I thought it would be really interesting for you. So go ahead and check it out. Ah, okay. But I think you have to be a little bit careful now, not to not to get restricted from you to me. Well, well, well. As long as you don't, as long as that page where you're sending them to, as long as the information is free and you're not asking for an email address mm. on that page, so you can't have like an opt-in or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. You can't direct students to like a sign-up page or an opt-in page or something like that. But just a a, a resource that's totally. That's totally fine. And then, you know, people still see your website, right? And so, you know, some of the people that will go to that blog post, they will, they will, they will still sign up. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now your actual focus is on producing videos and more content on Udemy? Or what, what, what is your, your next step? Like, you already went through very different phases in your online entrepreneur life. Yeah, so right now I have kind of like two focuses uh focus number one is is becoming a you know one of the top Udemy instructors um and and the focus number two is uh to build out my Airbnb business so to grow my blog to get more book sales uh, like I said I just launched the second version so the, the book is going to be like I think it's going to be over 300 pages now so it's it's a really pretty big resource is it uh, I want to grow No, no, I'm, uh, it's with the, uh, with the interior designer right now. So we'll, we're, I'm planning to launch it somewhere probably halfway May, May, mid-May, end to May, okay. May end May. Cool. And, um, you know, I want to grow the podcast. So I really enjoy teaching other people how to use Airbnb. I really like helping people with their Airbnb listings, improving their results. And I know how much value there is because, 
you know, if you if you optimize your listing and you get like, you know, just three or four more bookings in a month, that, that can make you a lot of extra money, right? Mm. So there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of opportunity, and and uh, you know, I'm very passionate about Airbnb, so it's something that I really uh, enjoy doing, and uh, so I, w- I definitely want to grow that business. Right. Sounds 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 very really cool. It sounds like a plan, and I think it shows like um, you you should be always ready and willing to adapt to new situations even if google shuts down your business you should be i think willing to to make a lifelong learning especially being on the road as a digital nomad yeah absolutely uh, i mean every, everything that happens every time you come across an obstacle it always turns out to be a blessing in disguise, you know, it always something that will propel you to the, to the next level. So, mm. you know, I would, I would say to everybody out there who's, you know, maybe starting a business or who's thinking about starting a business, just know that there's going to be a lot of bears on the road. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of valleys, but, uh, but those, those moments are, are the moments where, you know, you, you will take action and, and, and those pro- usually tend to be a, a stepping stone towards the next level, towards making progress. So, you know, embrace those moments, don't fear them, and, um, you know, you'll, you'll be fine. Great. I think that's a, that's a good end of our episode. Thank you so much. Um, Jasper, where are you traveling at the moment? I'm in the Philippines right now. In Manila, right? That's right. And what, what are your next stops? When, when do we see us each again? Um, I'm going to Hong Kong next week. I, uh, I actually, I do some life coaching on the side as well. So I have a few clients there and then I think I'm going to Taiwan. Taiwan. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a place I always wanted to go to. Yeah. I've never been. So it's exciting. Yeah. Sounds really exciting. Okay. Jasper, thanks for your time. See you on the road. And okay, Marcus, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and uh, auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> auf Wiedersehen, my friend. Bis bald. Okay, guys. Okay, ciao. Ciao. Okay, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Life Hacks Show, the um, DNX podcast. Uh, see you next time. I'll hear you next time. Uh, peace and out. Yes, yes, yo. This was another episode of the Life Hacks Show. If you love what you're listening to and can use some of the tools and hacks we are sharing on the Life Hacks Show, I would be more than happy if you can give me a review or rating on iTunes. Follow me on facebook.com slash Moira Marcos and just ping me and give me some feedback that would mean the world to me. So long, have fun, peace and out.